Welcome, everyone. I'm John Featherston, the CEO of RAS Media. Today's discussion on the M&A and valuation landscape is a precursor to one of the topics covered in detail at the 34th annual RAS Media CEO and Leadership Exchange this coming September. This year, we'll be hosting the CEO Exchange at the beautiful Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. What you're going to see here today is an example of the quality of information, expert advice, and of course, when we're all together in person this coming September, the networking experiences and opportunities that you will have at our CEO Exchange. It's a great way for you to learn, renew relationships, and meet new professionals all immersed in residential real estate. Now, on today's state of the valuation and M&A landscape, whether your interest is in valuing your own firm or evaluating the use of mergers and acquisitions as a strategy to expand your real estate business, you owe it to yourself to know as much as possible about how to, successful, how to successfully achieve your goals and objectives in M&A. Today's economy is changing, and the M&A uh, landscape is affected by the changing economy. Today, we're moving away from the pandemic-led real estate marketplace into a new market driven by rising interest rates, rising inflation, continued low inventory conditions. Yet, according to the Wall Street Journal today, consumer confidence in residential real estate remains extremely strong. While M&A has been a strategy employed within our industry for decades, as history continues to teach us, Knowing how mergers and acquisitions were accomplished in the past isn't necessarily a blueprint for success moving forward. Real estate business models have changed. The economics have changed. Technological infrastructure and systems are different. All these factors and much, much more must be considered when valuing a company. During our website and webinar today, Please feel free to use the question section of the GoToWebinar app as we do our best to answer any questions you might pose to us throughout the, the broadcast. Today, with the assistance of a few great RAS Media friends who have all successfully employed M&A strategies in their businesses and who will all be joining us at the CEO Exchange in Washington this September, let's get started and examine Today's state of the valuation and M&A landscape. I'm honored to inter introduce one of our industry's foremost experts on mergers and acquisitions, my good friend, Mr. George Schlusser. George. Thank you, John. Uh, it's always a pleasure to discuss my favorite topic, M&A, but I wanna thank the audience for being with us today. And you know, we're gonna start with a quick overview of the current state of M&A activities then we get to ask questions, as John said, from our incredibly experienced and successful panel. But I also just wanted to encourage you to attend the CEO and Leadership Exchange. We're going to be able to dig a lot deeper into each of the topics, and we're going to have multiple M&A panels. So let's get started. I believe M&A activity is at a critical tipping point. It may have been obvious, but as John said, the last few years has seen a huge amount of industry consolidation. It's been the most active market I've seen in my 40 years. The huge increase in the quantity and the price point of home transactions has created the perfect opportunity for both buyers and sellers to benefit. In this market cycle, there are more potential buyers than ever before. This included a number of new well-funded stock exchange-backed entrants. There are new business model startups with cash. There are also many private owners of all sizes flush with capital. All these factors combine for an unprecedented frenzy of activity. A lot of the sellers as well, many had ridden out the 2008 recession cycle, promising themselves they needed just one more run, then they'd get out. Some were of the age, it was time there was no clear family member or internal succession plan. And for a select lucky few, the financial offer was just too good to pass up. The last few years have been a great time to be a seller, maybe the best in history. So how about all the buyers? They too all appeared to be brilliant during this run. Almost every acquisition was successful and quickly accretive. The market lift made everyone happy and most people a lot of money. This brings us to today. So this is my opinion only, but we're quickly shifting to a buyer's market. 
m a will continue to be active and viable but not at the same levels we've seen in the last few years not at the same valuations and not the favorable terms we've seen recently for sellers let me explain why quite simply there'll be less buyers and less sellers in the next couple of years I know at least three publicly traded real estate companies that have recently paused all their M&A activity. Many privately owned companies are starting to feel a need to conserve cash, creating a less competitive buyer's market. For sellers, most believe there'll be fewer home sale transactions closed in 2022 than 2021, and even less in 2023. Uncertainty is that the future market will result in lower valuations and yield a more favorable term for buyers. It's also normal during this phase, there'll be sellers that will not be realistic. I've actually seen a few of these recently we've worked with, but it's gonna take a while until a realization finally sets in that their firm may be worth less than it was last year or even six months ago. This means there may not be as many motivated sellers. But there is good news going forward, however. Whether you're a buyer or seller, there will be opportunities. You'll just have to work harder to find them. During every past downturn, there's always been a healthy level of M&A activity. The benefits are still there. The foundational principles of a consolidation, which is increasing profits through the economies of scale, continues to make good business sense to sellers and buyers. But because of the desire to grow firms in a declining market, M&A will continue, but the type of acquisitions I believe will shift very soon to more of a consolidation play. This means one of the firms closing an office or combining some of their offices, we call these roll-in or fold-in acquisitions. These are very profitable to both sides. By eliminating most of the fixed expenses of one office and then adding that revenue to the other office, much of that revenue drops to the bottom line. For sellers, this is a way to maximize their firm's value. M&A transactions can be risky because as all of you know, most of the firm's value is the agent population and they get to vote with their feet every night. Maximum value is all about reducing risk through agent retention and continued agent productivity. These are the key drivers of every successful transaction, regardless of the financial deal points negotiated. Agent productivity and agent retention will result in whether it's a successful transaction or not. So every M&A transaction has two major components. The first being the financial side. I call it the tangible part. Most owners understandably focus here first on the money. How much is my company worth? Or if you're a buyer, how much should I pay? The financial considerations are somewhat obvious, but include cash, terms, and ongoing obligations. The intangible ones, for me, is the most critical for a successful transaction. If I were to rank the areas I believe that are most important, it would be compatible culture first, similar business model second, and then financial considerations third. Even if the company is offered or given to you for free, <laughs> culture and business model are far apart, there's a high likelihood of failure. So if agent retention is so important, how are real estate firms sold and valued? So we can't go too in depth today, but I wanna share a quick overview. To get to a firm's value, adjusting the earnings and expenses are the key. The numbers shown on most firms' financial statements do not reflect the actual profitability. Most of us run lifestyle type companies with the goal of minimizing the taxes. So you have to get to an adjusted EBITDA, which is not easy, but something we'll have to discuss in another section, session. Once you have your EBITDA, then you proceed to the second part of the formula, which is the market multiple. So what is the mysterious market multiple and where do you get it? Many of you feel, I'm sure it's pulled from air, but it's not. So in the valuations we do, we use a proprietary market algorithm that we've developed. It takes into consideration the current comparable transactions of like size companies. That's supposedly most of the market multiple, current comparable transactions of like size companies. But we also adjust for many factors that we feel are critical. And this is where the goodwill comes in, the reputation, historical earnings, the quality of earnings. Productivity of the agents, the size, GCI and sales volume, 
and most importantly, company dollar retention, the profit margin, and EBITDA size. Please know that consistently growing larger firms, which is where you want to get to, with strong management, good margins, and a desirable market, have earned and always received the highest market multiple. So we're going to quickly look at my view on the current market. It definitely is in flux, but here's what I, I that we're witnessing in real time from the firms that we've worked with recently. So this is mostly for firms under 10 million of GCI with adjusting it out fairly, that's the key, and then averaging the last three years. But in this size range, most sellers want a multiple of EBITDA in the fours. And with larger, closer to 10, one in the high fours and, and down in the low fours. But buyers right now are only willing to pay in the threes for the most part, and that's where they want to stay. And they're meeting somewhere in this price range in a 3.7 to 3.9 range for a valuation. And this is with 20 to 25 percent of the cash up front and then two to four years of earnout, which is based on the performance with three being the average. The most I've seen is five, but typically it's three or four years. And then there's beginning to be a premium paid for the fold in up to 50 or 60 basis points. And I think you'll see that uh, become more and more prevalent uh, in the next six to nine months. For firms over 10 million, there really is typically less risk to the buyer if the integration's done well. They're still commanding at least a 50 to 100 basis point premium. So the larger firms, again, with good management and good locations are still getting a, a premium. So I wanna leave you with this thought and we're gonna get to their panel. I believe M&A is a great way to grow a company, but it's not the best solution for everyone. If you're selling what is probably your biggest asset, get some experienced help. If you're on the buying side, get all the help you can on the first transaction or two at the least. Growing through M&A is fun and it's exciting, but please remember what an early mentor of mine once told me, the best decision you might ever make on an acquisition may be the decision to pass on a particular opportunity. Now on to our illustrious panel, and, and we do have a good one. So first up is my good friend, Larry Rideout. Larry is chairman and co-owner of Gibson Sotheby's International Realty. Larry has more than three decades of experience in building real estate companies throughout the country. Under his leadership, Gibson Sotheby's has evolved through acquisitions and strong organic growth from 55 associates into the leading independently owned firm in Massachusetts and one of the finest firms in the country. Today with 25 offices and over 450 associates. Larry, thank you for joining us today. Hey, George, how are you? And I am honored to be in with this group, I have to say. Uh, thank you. So I just want to start out with when you began, um, did you have a strategy to grow through m a when you first started? And then how has it worked out for you? Yes, I'm really kind of a simple person. So I keep everything ba as basic as I can. And uh, if I were to sum it up in a couple of words, it would be uh, we follow the lead, follow the leads. In other words, our growth was driven by the uh, we started out with two offices. We were suddenly uh, impacting a market nearby, and, and we noticed that if we were there, we could do much better. Uh, we went over there and you know, we found a company that would fit the uh, criteria that we looked for, and we acquired it. And then it just kind of grew from there. We followed, uh, just followed, we'd had two of the companies we bought were because we had an inordinate amount of referrals happening in that market, and we thought, why? Are we continuing to do referrals when we're close enough to be there. So we've grown from the three offices to the 25 offices pretty much up with that same strategy. Wow, and, and <clears throat> how do you assess the potential acquisition candidate when you're looking at someone? You know, the most important thing, and you put it, you said it on one of the slides tonight, we've never varied from that. I guess, you know, I can say we've, we've done about 13 of these uh, merger acquisitions and I can say one or two of them have not been successful. So maybe we did vary from it uh, at some point, but it's generally most important to us is the culture of the company. Because one of the most important things is when you're trying to integrate two companies is that they actually believe and think the same way. Uh, so there's many times to George's point that we've gone in, I've met someone and we walked out and decided not to do it because we just didn't think it was gonna fit or nor would it work. So for me, the culture is the most critical piece. Uh, in terms of valuation, 
it's no secret. I, I was talking to John earlier that, you know, I look back to see how many I had done just out of curiosity. And it was like 13. I did uh, seven of them right after 2008 because it was a really good time to do that. And then uh, up to, from 2019 till today, we've done six more. And th these last six, we picked up George. George and I are friends from years and years ago, but I've never really used him. And we did the last six deals with George and uh, they've been phenomenally successful. And that's probably been the biggest impetus of growth for us in the, in the company. Thanks, Larry. And I'll just interject. So you, you have used me to primarily do the valuation, a little bit of negotiation, but what do you think is beneficial with someone, third party person doing the valuation rather than yourself? Well, the beneficial part, what I learned was that, you know, I'm not, they're not shooting the messenger. When I come in with numbers, I come in with an evaluation, I come in to talk about the, the multiple that we're going to pay. I'm coming in with uh, essentially George's information. And all I'm doing is delivering the message that I had this third party do the numbers, do the evaluation, and now it's my time to deliver to you. We can obviously call George in and, and discuss with him what he thought and why he thought these numbers were the way they were. And then the two of us, or three of us, or five of us, whatever it is, we can hammer it out. But it takes, it, it, it adds that third party, that arm's length transaction for me. I'm not, I'm not the guy saying, this is what I think you're worth, and here's what I'm going to pay you. It's more or less, I'm taking the advice of a third party, and let's work it out together. Yeah. So you come in more of a partner rather than a bad guy to try to get it done. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, because a lot of times the first guy in with the price, uh, it gets shot. Yeah, I learned that on the first six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the the owners that you've bought, bought how uh, important has it been to keep the owner involved, and for how long do you like to keep the owner involved after the sale? I think uh, it's important that they stay involved, and in, in, but not through the entire term of the of our agreement. But I think a ninety day, at least ninety days, I need them there. Just they're the glue. Uh, that that associate has bought into that owner, and they believe in that owner. And it's important for them to see the owner has bought into the new entity and is is a part of that uh, transition. I have a we have a trans we've done enough now that we have a transition team that goes in and stays with the company for at least 60 days, and it might be two people. But they're there every day so that when the question comes up, most times in the beginning, the agent will go to the previous owner and, and kind of say, I, you know, I can't get this or I don't understand that. And that's where our transition team intervenes and kind of takes them by the hand and walks them through everything. So it's critical that they have a, that owner there to, to go and kind of commiserate with, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I think you made a really important point I just want to emphasize where you have a team that actually goes and stays in the office and is always there all the time so there's no issues or questions or they can sort of get the pulse of what's going on. Is that correct? Exactly. They, they, that's so. That's probably the most important thing after the, op, after the acquisition that we can do. And we learned again, it's, you know, we learned the hard way in many ways and that's kind of a real estate uh, thing, I guess. But the idea of having one someone there that understands our all of our business and how we do our business and and be available to the new new company is so critical and it's, and it's worked extremely well for us yeah. and you mentioned earlier a couple of them didn't work as hoped why didn't they work as hoped do you think uh one we i didn't pay attention i'm going to take full blame on on both of them the, the culture we were excited about the location we were excited about where that office might be and that how that might be such a change for the company and I, I overlooked the culture part on, on one of them it just was it was a bad call and we we got in it and we had to get out of it and it just the way it went the other one was a uh, we were at, actually at the closing table and uh, the the game was changed before we could sign on the dotted line he wanted well by the way I want to do this instead of that and we we walked out on that so that and that was a disappointment because we thought that was going to be a big uh, opportunity for us, but we walked away. Okay. Very good. So when do you know an acquisition has been successful? How long does it really take? Well, what I mentioned, the transition team, we we uh, we talk almost daily, but I would say weekly. How is it going? What's the temperature in there? How are people feeling? So that's probably the most critical piece for us. Uh, and then we, we listen to associate feedback because many agents aren't afraid to voice their concern or voice their compliments, which we hope we hear more than the concerns. And so we we, we kind of keep a temperature ourselves on that. And then, you know, third is the numbers. You know, you, we bought this at a valuation 
we have to at least meet this valuation for this to work for us. So, you know, at the end of a quarter, the end of six months, we start getting a sense of the, what we, well, how we're doing. And if it's not, the numbers aren't up to par, we need to step it up and figure out how to help them be more successful. Got it. And I know you've acquired many different brands and, and models, and you said the, the transition team is, is important. What else is critical, do you think, to a successful integration? Every every brand in my, you know, I, I work for a, a realty that is anywhere now, and I was their merger acquisition guy, essentially, for one third of the country. And every brand has its own uh, business model, how they operate. And what happened is in a, in a I'm, I'm with Sotheby's, I guess that's okay to say, Sotheby's International Realty. In, the, in that brand, there's a culture. And so sometimes, and I, this was one mistake I made that I didn't mention, was we bought into a, another brand and there's nothing wrong with that brand. Their culture is just totally different than ours. And we thought, you know, we'd get in there and make that change and everybody would be hugging each other and love would be overall, everybody would love one another. And it, didn't, it never worked out, it never changed. So we're very, before we do anything, I have to know that we can fit, that we fit uh, and we'll work together or, or just, I won't do it. Got it. So um, maybe last question, what do you think the M&A market currently is and, and where is it going the next six months? Well, you know, something you said again, I think that anyone that was thinking of selling that didn't do it in the last, you know, 18 months uh, may have missed a boat, but they didn't miss the boat. There's still a huge opportunity there for everybody. Uh, but right now, I think, uh, you know, the larger companies that have decided to step back from everything have opened the door for many of us. I don't know how many people are watching us here, but think about it. You know, everything isn't about uh, buying a, a 10,000 agent company. It's about growing in your market. And, and in my particular market, there isn't a lot of 300 uh, agent companies. We have to do it one little bite at a time. That opportunity is now available to all of us because the bigger guys that are paying the larger multiples that can you know close much more quickly than us, have a lot more capital than us, have stepped back. They've opened up the whole, uh, I'm excited for, the, for going forward to be honest with you. There's a lot of opportunities for now everyone. Very good. Thank you, Larry. We're gonna come back to you in a few minutes when we open it up to everyone. But uh, again, thank you for your expertise. Well said, Larry, thank you. Very nice. So our next panelist is Mark McLaughlin. He brings to us a unique perspective of being very familiar with both the buy and the sell side of the M&A transaction. In 2009, Mark acquired Pacific Union, a fine San Francisco Bay Area company. It was gen then generating two billion of sales volume, but also running a multi-million dollar negative EBITDA. 12 acquisitions later, Mark sold Pacific Union to Compass for a very large sum, I might add, because it was highly profitable and then generating more than 14 billion in sales volume with 2,200 agents. Mark's currently president of McLaughlin Ventures, using ex his experience advising firms in the M&A field. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, George. Thank you, John, Larry, and Rick, great to see you. Um, so I'll start out with a similar question to Larry, but when, when you bought uh, Pacific Union, did you have a strategy um, to go into M&A to grow it? And, and what was the thought process behind it? Well, the, the strategy to buy Pacific Union was, it, it was founded as an entrepreneurial boutique by five principals here in the Bay Area. GMAC bought it and changed its culture a little bit, which is ever so important in all of this. And so I, I acquired it as a strategic asset to return it to its boutique nature. And then we grew it um, in probably the darkest times, but then we got some some wind at our back. We grew it differently in Northern California than Southern California. In, in Northern California, we grew organically. We started with 17 offices and about 2 billion in trades, as you indicated, and we finished with 28 offices and about 8 billion in, in, in trades. Um, to grow to Southern California, there's just no way we could do it, recruiting one agent at a time. So we made the strategic decision to do it by acquisition. And in three years, we bought six companies down there, uh, three in the brokerage business, three in the um, escrow business. And effectively, what we did is we bought the number five firm, the number six firm, and the number 11 firm to create the number two firm in LA County. Um, so it was very strategic, uh, just done differently in, in both Northern and Southern California. 
So tell me a little bit about where a lot of those standalone offices, did you do fold-ins and sort of what's your take on the fold-in versus the standalone in the, the coming market? Yeah, I'll come, I'll, I'll come back to the fold-in because I've only done a couple of those and they were actually both in Northern California. But in Southern California, you know, these were firms that were each doing, two were doing about $2 billion a year and one was doing about a billion. They had, you know, between three and five offices and, you know, between 400 and 400, 400 and 500 days. It's a much bigger market than, than what Larry just described. Yeah. So they, they, you know, the challenge there was, in the purchase agreements, I've never seen two acquisitions that were the same, N never, like none of them are the same. Um, one brand wanted to integrate into Pacific Union immediately, one wanted to do it in 18 months, and one wanted to do it never. So, you know, we bought them anyway, but then it becomes sort of the art of the deal. Like, and, and I've, I've answered the question so many times at a cocktail party, what business are you gonna say in the real estate business? Everybody gets it, right? They didn't really care to begin with. But I'm not, we're not in the real estate business, we're in the people business. And if we don't get the people right, nothing else matters. So that journey down in Southern California was to get the people to believe in the in the power and the dream of the brand. Got it. Very good. Very well said. So how did you value the companies you acquired? You, well, the screen that you just shared with us was a, was a great template to start. Um, and the reason I think that I've never seen two deals the same is because you're buying a business from people and the motivations and expectations of those people are very, very different. One could be 50 years old and ready to run for 20 years. The other one could be 68 and ready to retire in two years. So while the multiples had a face value that were sort of as you described, the, intri the intricacies of each deal, the calibrated risks and rewards were very different from cash is currency, stock is currency, the length of the earnout you, you articulated between two and five years. And I'm a big believer that over three years is too long. It's just so much can change. So we, we maneuvered through those as best we could. But as a seller, the most, well, as a seller or a buyer, when you go through the, the market engagement and you get interested party, the trick is to find the party that will pay the premium. And I paid a premium for two different, what you call tuck-ins in Northern California, because they solve strategic business issues for me. Like I had an operation in um, Contra Costa County, the East Bay, struggling, like struggled for years. But so I could afford to pay more than anybody else to acquire a business in that market because it fixed my issue. I had another one of those in, a, in the urban high density condo marketing business. And by the way, I think Compass acquired Pacific Union to fix a business issue for them, to gain market share in California. So that's the trick, is to go out and find the buyer who can pay the premium. Fair enough. So how much did culture play into the companies you acquired? I mean, you mentioned it earlier, but uh, maybe elaborate. Yeah, I think all three of us will say culture is so critical. And two, I'll give you two examples. Uh, one, one, when I first started chasing the LA market, I I called four firms. I said, let's meet, you know, we've talked on the phone a bunch and I'm going to be down there on such and such a day, pick a location and I'll meet you. Well, all four met, picked the exact same restaurant in Beverly Hills. What are the chances <laughs> of that, right? All four of them. So I had to go to the maitre d', like, don't tell anybody I was here. Don't say do you want the same thing. Put me at a different table. But I got to see four different companies in the exact same day, in the exact same setting and how they, how we interacted. Now, two of those companies I ended up buying and two I ended up saying no to. And saying no is super important. You have to be able to be strong enough to say no. The second example is we entertained some top performers in the management team of, of another firm in the beach cities of, of, of Southern California. And then we went and had cocktails and dinner. And the behavior of two of the top performers who were shareholders at the cocktail party and the dinner just was, this is simple. I just say no. Like, no, thank you. And so you, as a buyer or a seller, you have to, you, you have to spend that, what I'll call social time, you know, not just spreadsheet time. Very, very well said. Breaking bread together is always important. Yeah. yeah. And you can say no, but any large mistakes you made when buying a company or any wish you had not acquired? Oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. <clears throat> You know, I think that 
you, I keep talking about people, but I think our successes and our failures were a function of people and not trusting our instincts, either trusting our instincts or not trusting our instincts. And there are two acquisitions that I made that, damn, I should have trusted my gut. And then the ones that were like ragingly successful were maybe it didn't look that way on paper, but you really liked the individual or the team. And you just said, you know what, this is one to roll the dice on. So you got to trust, you got to focus on people and you got to trust your instincts. Yeah, very good. Well said. So switching to the sales, sales side, what was the experience like being a seller? And uh, what did you learn from being on the other side of the transaction? Well, I would have to say that had I not done, you know, a dozen transactions as a buyer, I think I probably would have been eaten alive as a seller. Um, so the experience going through that, it's, it's a lot harder to be a seller than it is to be a buyer. <clears throat> going through that experience was invaluable. And um, as I articulate to some of my clients, you know, did you read paragraph 24? Yep, yep, I read it, I got it. Did you read paragraph six? Yep, yep, I read that. What's the big deal? Have you ever read them together? Like, if you don't do what's in paragraph 24, you will not get what's in paragraph six, and that's the earnout. So there's just so many moving parts, you know, and so many different places to focus. And um, yeah, so that, that would be, my experience as a seller is the day you sign that letter of intent and then they back up the truckload of due diligence documents that they want, you know, they almost bury you. <laughs> <clears throat> I understand. So any, anything that uh, you would suggest to a potential buyer to, that, uh, that uh, you wanted to be treated differently or a more beneficial way that uh, would help a potential buyer with a seller? You, my answer is kind of the same. You know, it's people. You, you got you to gotta invest time in the individual or individuals who are the sellers because the day the deal closes is the day the journey begins. It's not the day that the deal ends. And you have to be able to go into the, foxhole with them or to the mountaintop and declare victory either way you want to know who's on your team okay that's so good um everyone should write that down that it really doesn't start till the deal closes and then the whole whole uh potential for success is uh, going to be laid out there the next two or three years as you said so and one one final thing one final thing for sellers the loi is so 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 important because the leverage shifts to the buyer the day it's signed mm -hmm. just think about that the leverage shifts to the buyer the day it's signed so important very well done thank you mark we'll come back to you okay well, thanks, sir. great information very well done so our next panelist is rick haas he's been leading real estate brokerage strategy and operations for over 30 years he's completed dozens of real estate and related services mergers and acquisitions He's currently president and COO of United Real Estate Group based in Dallas, where he's led its growth from the 139th largest firm by transaction volume to now the seventh largest. And they recently crossed the 20,000 agent mark. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Rick. Thanks for the invite, George. John, so glad you, to be here. Rick, you've obviously had great success doing acquisitions with a number of companies. And so what has been your, your thought or your strategy of, you know, why, why, why grow through M and A's? Um, I think, I think because it's a, it's a growth accelerator. I mean, you know, it, to be acquisitive in, in this, to be in the business is to be acquisitive, whether you're, you're trying to acquire one-off agent recruiting and, and get organic agent growth or, you do it through M&A, and we just have always had, and I've always had an approach that it's not an or, it's an and. You do both. There's just too much opportunity to, um, if you, if one of your corporate uh, values is, or company values is growth, um, and it should be, and I'll, I'll, I'll say why I think that is, if, if it's growth, then you, you've got to approach both of them with, uh, with, with equal passion. Um, organic growth proves the value of your business model, and it says that day by day, street street by street, people want to join your company. And then um, M and A is just literally an accelerator. When done properly, it, it takes years out of organic growth uh, strategy. 
So you can you can add, add, add a lot of growth in a very short period of time. But fundamentally, and here's why I said I think it, it has to be, you have to be growth oriented. The core economics of this business in the time that I've been in it have changed tremendously. Um, I started in the real estate business as an agent when we were doing that, when I was doing that kind of work, I was ha glad to have the 50% that my broker shared with me of the GCI. Glad to have it. Thought it was, you know, well-deserved that he gets to keep half and I get half. As that, as we migrated so fast away from that, be it from the Remax or Keller Williams or, or now uh, transaction fee companies like we run, um, the economics are changing dramatically, and and they they will continue, and that that change is accelerating. It's not slowing down. If you don't get scale, then you probably don't have enough. Um, you probably don't have enough revenue in your company to pay agents what they want, need, and deserve today to be able to recruit and retain them. And and so scale is is just part of part of what we do. And then as you lay in other lines of business, mortgage, title, insurance, whatever that may be, then that scale acts as an amplifier to your overall financial performance. So yeah, M&A has been a strategy from the beginning right alongside organic growth. We have to have the systems in place to do both. And the last thing I'll say on the organic side, George, is that um, when you're in the marketplace, any market, and we're in 46 states with 20,000 agents, but with any marketplace we're in, where we have good organic growth, we have a more ready, willing, and able broker community to talk to us about joining our company. But if we have stagnant growth in a market, and we go, we're out there talking to people about what their succession plan is, and, you know, and, and, and they're like, who are you? What's the, why should we even think about you? So I think organic growth feeds the M&A um, especially well when brokers are quietly, business owners are quietly seeing our organic growth and wondering what that's all about. So. Very well said. So you've done a lot of acquisitions. Is there a typical one or what does one look like that you've been involved with? Oh, gosh. Um, well, first, uh, the process of getting to the table. I, I love what Mark said at the end of, of his comments because, um, you know, I used to say we got another one across the finish line or we got another one across the goal line. And that signifies language wise, it's the stopping point. But it's, it's absolutely not. It's the starting point. The closure, and we had one today, I, I can't go into it, but we had a, a, thousand agent, uh, a thousand agents join us today. The closing of the transaction is actually the starting, that's the starting gun going off because integration um, integration, and um, bringing, bringing the companies together is what makes the, the M&A work. And if you don't, it's, it's kind of like in the in the office by office strategy. If you have a recruiting strategy and you have a but you don't have a retention strategy, then you're on a hamster wheel that's just a tiring place to live. But in the M and A world, it's the same thing. If you don't have integration or retention strategies in place and really working well, then you're going to acquire. You'll be acquisitive. You'll have some success getting people to the finish, no starting line. But it'll be the hamster wheel because you won't retain it. Uh, I, I had a, uh, I had a guy, his name was, some of you may know him, uh, uh, Vince Aveni and Joe Aveni. I worked for in Northern Ohio for, for a long time, for 10 years. And when I was there, um, they used to, they used to say that M&A, and that's an, that was an amalgamation of 67 different companies during my time there. But they used to say that synergy, uh, everybody talks, uses that word, but it's one of those words that's overused and underdelivered on. But synergy is one plus one equals three. Too often times in this business, M and A in real estate, one plus one equals one, uh, two. Instead of one plus one equaling three, it equals one plus one equals one and a half. And that's because they don't understand how not to break what they just bought. And there's some key fundamental strategies that we we deploy uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so. Yeah. Very well said. It was a nice intro to a plug to the September event again. So one of the breakouts is going to be called uh, Getting to Yes. And then the second one will be Now That You Have Yes, What Do You Do? So it's it's really right. about half halfway Perfect. there when yes. So, you know, um, uh, every, 
George, everybody talked so far, Larry and Mark talked about um, the people side of it. And I know that to the audience, that might sound like soft, fuzzy issues, but it turns out to be the core principle. Um, one of the reasons we've been so successful, and, and today was, I think, my 40th, uh, just or, or just maybe 39th in the last 10 years. But um, one of the reasons we're, ex we're, we're so successful has to do with, A, the team we have, because none of this happens with individuals. You have individuals in front of you today, but this is all, this is all team play, from our CFO to our brilliant CEO, Dan Duffy. Um, and, and so it's team play, but it's about the people. And there's a lot of conversation I hear people talking about in the M&A space that are working the mergers and acquisitions and say cultural alignment, cultural alignment. And I wanna be really clear. Culture does matter, but cultural homogeny to us is is actually not a good thing. We want that diversity. We we have people like Steve Wagner, four thousand agents in Atlanta that have joined us. Philip Cantrell, brilliant man. He's Nashville, fourteen hundred agents. Cindy Benchek, a thousand, and John Nestor, a thousand agents at CRR. Scott Denise, two thousand two hundred agents join us in that in that transaction in Kansas City and beyond. Danny and Charlene, 200 agents. So in the spectrum, we go from 200 to 4,000 agents in our in our in the four years that uh, three and a half years that I've been here. So Jeannie Rogers, 800 agents. Uh, Rick Rogers, they all have talent, and it's all about the people. But if you put us all in a room and said, "Does that look like the same leadership style to you?" The answer would be not only no, but I'll just say absolutely not, <laughs> um, because it's the diversity and the, the intellectual capital that they bring to our to help rocket fuel our our growth. Without those folks, it's a P&L game. And too many people talk about too many people talk about what this this acquisition will do to your your P&L, your balance sheet. But what it does to the to the organization from an intellectual capital perspective is I believe, and I know you're gonna think this is an overstatement, it's not. I believe it's more important over time. Um, a lot of, lot of concentration on how to have shared ownership, how to buy a company, how to have shared ownership, but very seldom do people get into the, the work prior to the closing, do they get into the, what's shared leadership of this company gonna look like? And so, you know, it's definitely just like what Mark and Larry said. It's it's about the people for us. Fair enough. So, Rick, uh, how have you dealt with sellers that didn't want to give up their brand or their name? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't. It's not. Um, oh gosh, I'm going to get in trouble. I think it's the height of ego to say that our brand. Like, if if we would have taken United Real Estate and tried to paint it across the largest real estate company in Atlanta, VPR, 4,000 agents, and said, hey, use United Real Estate. George, you know from the valuation perspective, most of what we buy is the goodwill. What would we be doing to our goodwill investment if we just swiped that brand clean and said, nope, paint everything with United? There may be a day where we unify, but right now we're perfectly content, and we feel like one of the reasons we don't break stuff that we buy it when we buy it or merge it into our company is because uh, two fundamental principles. We, we keep business as usual for that company. And that means not tearing, like, you know, ripping the bandaid off of their brand. Yeah. And the second is we fundamentally as a team, Dan, Dave, Scott, Rick, Mike, we all believe that, um, that the people who are smartest to run the company that we're acquiring are the people who built it, not us. And if you don't have that fundamental belief, then you kind of say, well, let me show you how, let me show you how it's going to be after you, you buy it. And uh, so the process of integration and not breaking stuff comes from the fundamental belief that none of us are as smart as all of us will just because they, they're now owned all or partially by United Real Estate doesn't mean that we know how to run their company better than, than they do. They built it. They're in the trenches for the last 10, 15, 20 years. They know what to do. We just help them. Thank you, Rick. George, I've got a 
we're, we got a couple questions if you wouldn't mind i want to kind yeah. of uh, can i just say one thing john and i'm going to turn it over yeah. to you for that but i just want the audience to know that what mark said about every transaction being different is so true but we're also talking about thousand agent transactions and 10 person offices and 20 person offices and it really varies on strategy and all so just so just know there's context to what everyone's saying is that there's different size different markets different geography so just just be careful on uh on assessing what you're hearing that's all all good all good information yeah. good point all george those those uh our acquisitions range from 200 to 4,000. so yeah all different sizes that, that, brings, that goes right into this next question for all of you i mean um we're getting a, a number of people asking us um uh can you speak to the strategies for uh sourcing potential acquisition candidates for um some of our uh, our audience how do you best source potential acquisition uh candidates mm -hmm. I'll Larry, tell you. What I'll take the least sophisticated, I guess. I'll, I'll be the guy that leads that way. We, you know, we just do everything in a basic strategy. Uh, if we're interested in a market, we get the, uh, we analyze the marketplace. We analyze the companies that are there. Uh, and again, I'll speak to the culture. We need to know about the company and if what their merit is, how they might fit us. And if there's no company there that makes us comfortable, we won't go there. But if there is one, we will, we'll, uh, I always tell everyone, <coughs> I'm sorry, just joking, but, uh, you know, it's, it's the price of a lunch to go invite someone to lunch and say, we're in an acquisition or an expansion mode and we're not going away. And you're 15 years, going to be here another 15 years. You may not be thinking about selling at this moment, but I want you to know when you do, I would love a phone call. I would love the first call. And it's really important to us because you fit us, we think you're, you're a perfect fit for us, and we think we could grow together very well. And then we buy lunch and we leave. I've had numerous 60 day later phone calls because they weren't really thinking about it, but the fact that I brought it to their attention and offered to be someone that could help them, I ended up acquiring a company. So for me, and from our perspective, again, you know, to George's point, and, and I love listening to Rick and Mark because their perspectives are, are very interesting for me. And, Kind of exciting, but I don't know what I'd do with a thousand person office or how I did the transition. The, the thing is, uh, it's it's about, you know, it's about working within your marketplace and it's about finding that company. You, you're all aware of your companies in your marketplace and you're aware a couple of things that are important. What's the consumer think of the company? And more important, what do other agents think of the company? And, and once you get that feeling that everything is good, good, that's somebody worth talking to, worth buying lunch. And moving on and hoping that they give you the call which they will let me ask another question that's come up if you were an owner of a 40 to 60 agent office firm single office firm how would you best go about uh, uh, exploring uh, the sale of your your company mark you want to tackle that first then we'll pass it around sure i, I think the available buyers for a firm of that size are significantly larger than uh, you know a buyer for a thousand agents so um the due diligence that that seller should do would be kind of the exact reverse of what larry just said you know who's in the marketplace that i think my people would map to with their culture and dna and things like that and together do we be does one plus one become two and a half or three you know and um uh, so I, I would take the exact opposite or the, the reflection of the process that Larry just uh, articulated. George? Oh, I get to answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I think I believe Mark made the, the right point there. Um, and I would also get some professional advice on your first one. There's a lot of people out there that would offer advice, all the people on this call. But um, if you're marketing your biggest asset, um, this is going to be a, a very significant transaction for you. So uh, again, culture is important. I think as important or more important than any financial considerations. So as Mark said, there may be uh, five buyers and then you begin to look at each of them and how, how best you would fit with them. And it's all on motivation too. What's your motivation and timeline? Larry? Well, I agree with what Mark said. You know, it, if I was going to be the seller, 
the first conversation I like to hear from a seller is that they're concerned about their agents and how they're going to end up, not about the money, not about the financials. So to me, that's the most important thing they can tell me is that they have invested in their agents and they want the right thing for them. So as a seller, I would do the same thing. I would make sure, and I know my market, I know who I would talk to, and I, they would be the first, first people on the list that I would call. And, and one thing that I would add to that is that whether you're a buyer or seller and you begin the journey, you're going to be 100 days into it before you decide to tell your firm. The day you tell your – so you're on day 100 or 101. The day you tell your firm, they're on day one. They need the amount, same amount of time to process that you had. Yep. And that's when the buyer and the seller are going to have to play their trust card. Like, you've trusted me to make decisions like this before. I need you to trust me again. You know, here's, here's a question that just came up, and I think this goes. Uh, hey, John. Yes, John. Right. Let me let me just add into that. You know, one of the one of the real red flags in the, in early conversations is exactly what guys are talking about. If if you find an owner is kind of in an I me mine kind of state of mind, a culture that it's all about what it, what am I going to get? How is it going to work for me? And that in the first couple of conversations, you don't find them worrying about what Larry just talked about. How is this going to affect my agents? Um, it's it's usually speed of the leader, speed of the team kind of warning sign that you're, you're probably talking to somebody where you would close that transaction and have a lot of agent retention risk. So as a as a seller, be real concerned about genuinely real concerned about what how this benefits the, your agents, especially if you're using George's formula of earnout. Um, if, if the acquiring company trashes or makes it uncomfortable and agents leave, you're not going to get paid. You get paid, you know, according to George's formula, 25 or 30 percent. We usually close at around 50 percent. But George's formula, that means all that money, those those second and third payments that are coming are at risk if they don't know how to manage um, the integration and, and, and uh, transition. Um, we're really fortunate. You, like literally, I said it's nearing 40. You could call every one of those people, those brokers, and ask them. And we encourage people who are thinking about joining us to do that. Ask them what it was like to go through the transaction with us. You know, they'll talk about like Mark. They'll talk about the documents backing up and the due diligence and all that. But ultimately, they're going to say that this has been an incredibly good transaction, and that that's that fills the top of your opportunity pipeline when you have um, fans that you created from the previous transactions you did. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, John, but I didn't no, want to move off that. Great information. Next, next question came in, and this has to do with all three of you. Uh, I think we'd love to hear uh, the insight, and of course, from our expert, George. Uh, there's a question comes in and says, um, how much staff is required to bring on a, an acquisition of 300 to 1,000 agents at a time? And how long is the process from when um, and the um, agents are told, and then it's and then it's fully integrated into the new owner? And what are the what's the spillage from a, a, a an acquisition of that size? I'll I'll concede to Rick on that. <laughs> Guys, I I've been down this road with our uh, financial sponsors, our private equity folks, and. Have been. I was asked it three years ago when you start this campaign. You know, what do you expect breakage to be? Is is a common term that's used in the industry. And I know again, it's it's. We just don't break it. We don't have agents leave. We just don't have. I mean, look, if some if somebody was hoping to be the buyer and they don't get the, they don't buy the company they were working as an agent in or something like that, they might have some early exit plans. But that's just not been our experience. We. We don't have breakage. We don't factor breakage into the pro forma because we know we have a track record that, that says it's not going to happen. If you do it right, it's not going to happen. That's super important. Yeah, and, and, and let me just add, um, ideally, um, in all the models that have done in the, the past, we, we probably do factor in a 5% uh, spillage, breakage, whatever you call it, just uh, to make sure that you're covered from a conservative standpoint. But 5% is, is typically the, I think, an industry standard of where you look at and you hope for zero and you plan for five. But if you start getting down into the low 90s or below 90s, you've got problems. Uh, the, the models don't work and you're not gonna have a successful transaction. 
but I would I would plop their five percent in there just uh, to make sure you got a little leeway there. So if you're doing so, your homework right, correctly as we as you move through the M&A process, as um, all of you have brought this out, uh, and I'll go back to Mark, um, uh, you know, who was driving home culture and people, as you all did. But if you've done, if you're doing your homework, like when Mark, you flew down to Southern California, um, it's amazing. You can tell us offline the name of the restaurant that everyone <laughs> likes to go to. <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, um, it, you know, if you're doing your, your homework correctly and you're investigating not just the financial aspects, the transaction, dollar volume, et cetera, but it's the people and the culture, um, that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the more you do on that front end, uh, the less the spillage or the breakage is on the on the back end. Uh, what are your what's your experiences, uh, Mark, uh, in well, the building? Uh, yeah, so it, it wasn't a Denny's, but I will give you the name of it offline. <laughs> um, the, you know, to the context of your question, buying a firm of 300 to 1,000, I think the most important um, question I would ask is how big is the buyer? If the buyer is Rick, it's no big deal at all. Um, when I bought Pacific Union, I had my my firm had 24 agents and an IT guy on a beeper and a bookkeeper on a beeper. So like you know, we I didn't have a staff, and so I would I walked into the first meeting with with the Pacific Union folks, and I said, you know what, I need you all a lot more than you need me because like I don't have a staff, I don't have a training department. So it really is a function of what house. Is it twice the size of your organization? Mine, it was it, it was eight times, eight to ten times. So that's one thing. And then number two, if you're going to do a number of acquisitions, you're going to need an FP&A role, a financial planning and analysis role, somebody who can do nothing but you know compare three companies next to each other and see what the operating differences are and things like that. So um, anyway, that would be my two cents on that. And and on my Compass acquisition or my Compass sale, Inman did us a favor and announced the deal three weeks before we were ready. Um, and we lo we lost exactly nine percent of our people and nine percent of our GCI. So if five percent is the industry standard, we outperform the standard. <laughs> wow, Rick. Yeah, that's a that's a, an all-out disaster. There's an old uh, saying or a fundamental principle called nature abhors a vacuum. And if there's a rumor out there and you can't fill it with the proper messaging. Nature is going to fill it with every agent's going to say, hey, this person's retiring or they cashed out or you've been sold. And then competitive rhetoric is going to flood in. All of these things I've had happen, we've had happen. So you have to be super diligent, prep the seller, make sure that it's, it's, it's not discussed. I was doing something one time. I walked into a grocery store and I noticed that at the produce counter, an agent was wearing a name badge of the company that we were acquiring. And I said, Oh, you're in real estate, you know, calling attention to the, the name badge. That's what she, that's why she's there. You know, you're in real estate. So am I, I'm Rick Haas. I'm president of XYZ. And she said, Oh yeah, you're the company that's buying us. And we we're two full months away from any projected closing date. And Mark, I just completely was like, Whoa, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. And she said, yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, that rumor mill took off and caused a lot of sleepless nights leading up to the the, the starting line, but the closing day. It, it's a you, confidentiality through the process is the utmost important. Yeah, it, it, it'll it'll rock both companies' boats. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, there's Sorry. no doubt confidentiality in a, in a financial transaction is imperative, um, and in an, in the industry that we're all in. Uh, which is a people person um, industry, okay? Um, uh, and uh, I being in the media, I can't tell you how many hundreds of times people have called me with off the record and please don't repeat this. And that Chinese firewall, I mean, although RASP would never do it, what happened to you, Mark, we wouldn't do that. Uh, but it's what happens in the grocery store or in the country club or in the, uh, you know, the local setting that can set back many, many uh, transactions. So it's, I think it's imperative, well, I think we'd all agree, it's imperative to keep that sphere of influence as far as uh, discussions of, a, of an acquisition or a role in a merger, whatever it might be, uh, to a very, you know, very, 
uh, trustworthy group. Yes, Rick. John, your your company is one of the only companies that we will trust with putting an announcement messaging. Because, you know, sometimes your agents see things in credible news media and it validates what just took place. It's not just my company saying that, look, John Featherston at Risk Media is publishing what good news this is or interesting, positive stuff. You're one of the only companies that we trust to have uh, those stories on embargo so that we know they're not going to do what Mark described because that is such a, a dangerous thing. So you you know it, you, you, you hear oh, the story. Thank you. I, I, I thank you, Rick. And you know what, the, the fact is our industry is built on relationships and um, uh, all, all four of you have, have, have uh, 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 espoused the, the value of culture and people. And those culture and people uh, uh, are uh, a, a core ingredient, I believe, in the success of a merger and acquisition. Okay, um, it's it's fitting the right round hole into a round hole, not a square hole into a square into a round peg. Now, with that, unfortunately, uh, George, we're we're running out of time here, and you guys have been terrific. George, some closing remarks, if you would. Well, again, I want to thank the panel and uh, the audience for being with us. You, you heard a lot of really incredible insight, and unfortunately, we could spend two days on this or three days about M and A and just touching the surface. So again, I want you to ask for help if needed. Uh, all of us would be glad to take a, a phone call or an email to try to help you, but you've got a lot of talent in your markets that you're in. And I'm pretty sure that uh, if you ask for help uh, with some friends, um, they'll talk to you about uh, the M&A business because everyone has an opinion and you just want to get as many uh, different opinions as possible, I think. So thank you again for being with us and John for hosting it. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank all of you individually. Uh, you know, Larry uh, Rock of uh, our, our real estate uh, industry, especially in the Northeast, uh, and a big Red Sox fan, etc. Uh, Rick, you're doing tremendous things, and you've done tremendous things on all aspects of our 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 industry, both as a traditional broker and a new model broker. And you're doing wonderful things and giving opportunities for many. Mark. Uh, you have been a tremendous um, uh, superstar in our industry and opened paths for many different people. I love what you did with Pacific Union, and I love what you're doing now, and, and uh, wish you all continued success. Um, in September, there's a couple of things on the housekeeping notes. Number one, in August, we're putting out a, um, a handbook on, on M&As and all four of the uh, uh, our panelists will be involved in uh, bringing that information out. September, uh, if you haven't already uh, registered, I'm going to send out a special email to everyone that's registered for today's event. Uh, that'll give you the early bird special still to attend in uh, the CEO Exchange in uh, Washington, D.C., um, where you'll have ample time, a tremendous amount of time to network with everyone that's on this panel and many more that have used uh, M&A as a, a way to grow their organization. And uh, there'll be a lot of people there, I'm sure, that we want to talk to you about the possibility of using that as, a, as an exit strategy. So everyone, thank you for being part of this. George, continued success. Larry, everyone, uh, Rick, congratulations on the 1000 agent firm. And Mark, continued success on the West Coast and in beautiful Jackson Hall. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank, awesome. thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.